King of Kings. Let's give a shout to Jesus. Yes. Come on, if you know that he is the one who can save, the one who can transform, the one who can set free, let him hear you right now. Let him hear your praises. Lift up a shout of praise. We worship you, God. We lift up your name. You're worthy of our praise. I'm going to give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Who came ready to hear from God tonight? If you came ready to hear from God, look to your neighbor and say, I'm ready. I'm going to say a quick word of prayer before we jump in. Father, we just ask right now that you would speak through me. You would speak right to our heart. We're here so that we can get a word from you. God, people are coming tonight with bondage and brokenness, with real life problems. But you're a God who's not far from us. You're a God that knows us very closely and you have the answer. It's Jesus. And I pray tonight lives will be transformed because of your word and your message. Holy Spirit, speak through me tonight. In Jesus' name, we all say amen, amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, wow, you look really good tonight. I am so excited tonight. Tonight is gonna be a gospel-centered message. Are you guys okay with that? All that means is it's a Jesus-centered message. Are you guys okay with that tonight? You know, I don't know what the Holy Spirit is up to, but he's up to something from worship. Give it up for the worship team, how awesome that was. To that altar call that Pastor did. At, he, we could have called altar right there. The, come on, let's give it up for that message we got from our pastor. But let's really give honor to our leaders and our pastors, Pastor Marco, Pastor Robert. That was like 20% of what they really deserve. Let's really hear it for our leaders. Thank you, Pastor Marco. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Thank you to all our leadership team for all you guys have done for us. Thank you. I am so thrilled to be up here, and I always treat this as an honor. And this is something that I don't take lightly. I am, for those that don't know, I am the young adult pastor here at The Way. Where are all the young adults at? Where are all the young adults at heart? Woo, come on somebody. I am here uh, with my wife. My wife is sitting over here in the corner. We're married officially a year and a certain amount of months. Three, okay. She gave me the cue. I, <laughs> I'll get there. Tonight we're gonna be talking about a very important message that I believe the enemy wants to keep us from understanding. There is no better way to know who you are than to know who Jesus is. And the best way to know who he is, is to know what he says. Not just knowing what he says, but knowing what he says about you. The title of tonight's message is Know Who You Are. Look at someone next to you and say, know who you are. The enemy knows that this is true. The enemy knows that the best way to get to know who you are and who you have been created to be, he knows that the only way is by knowing who God is. Since the enemy knows this is true, one of his greatest targets is to try and shape the way you think and especially shape your thoughts you have about yourself. If the enemy can take advantage of the way you see you, then he's captured your purpose and your destiny in life. Satan accomplishes his purpose when he gets you to doubt what God has already declared over your life. See, the words and the promises that God gives you, they're yes and amen. They're done. It's already accomplished, bought, and paid for, and there's nothing else we can do to change that. 
However, the enemy, he's sneaky and he can get us to doubt the promises and the declarations of what God says about you. See, know, knowing who you are in Christ is knowing the gospel. Some would say the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news message. It's really, really, really good news. I know you guys have gotten good news before. Good news, we just, uh, you know, the, I don't know, you got some good news. <laughs> I was trying to think of an example, but I couldn't really think on top of my head. You guys have gotten good news before. But this good news message beats it all. This news is so good that it's this. That Jesus already paid the debts that we owed. Just imagine if your credit card company called you and said, thank you so much for paying your balance in full. And you look at your, your husband or your wife and you go, did you pay that? They go, I didn't pay that. Did you? No. And the credit card company says, it's all good. We got the money. You're good. Your debt's been paid. How many know that's some good news? Someone just needs to snatch that down like, that's for me. I'm believing for that call. But this call, this news had so much power, it's so good, that Jesus paid the eternal debt that we owed. There was a debt that was so big, it would take literally an eternity to pay it off. We're talking about forever and ever and ever, a thousand years, a million years, and you haven't even scratched the surface, and you haven't even paid off the debt, not even a little bit. That debt has been paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. He paid the debt for you and I. This is the good news message. And everybody that believes, someone say everyone that believes, everyone that believes and puts their faith in Jesus will be saved. This is good news, guys. This isn't, this isn't, uh, you have to do all these acts and you have to get X, Y, and Z in order. And you have to get, take care of all this first. No, this is good news. This is the best news that you can ever get in your life. That Jesus already paid the price for you so that you can be free and healed and set free from the bondage and the debt that we owe. This is the gospel. And knowing who you are in Christ is knowing that good news. The great thing about this gospel message is that it accomplishes what religion can't. I'm going to jump into our scripture in just a second. See, religion says get to work because you have a lot to make up for and you're not good enough yet. You're way behind. The gospel says, I, Jesus, have made a way for you through my, I've made a way through my son so you can live free from the bondage. Religion just works on the outside, the gospel renews what's on the inside. Religion worships the acceptance of other people. G the gospel worships the one who has accepted us even while we are in our mess. Religion distorts your identity. The gospel reveals your true identity. Religion can't define you, but the gospel can. Tonight we're going to learn three truths about who you are. And we're going to learn this through the gospel message. Number one. Someone say number one. Three truths about who you are. Number one, it's not based on your worst. It's not based on your worst. Someone say that's good news. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. The Bible calls Satan an accuser, someone that accuses, accusing you of being no good, accusing you of the mistakes that you've made, constantly bringing up the past, accusing, accusing, accusing. And one of the enemy's greatest weapons is to base your identity on your worst moments. Revelations 12.10 says, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. 
the one who accuses them before our God day and night. It's interesting that the scripture says day and night. Because I think at times the enemy accuses us so much we can't even escape those thoughts. We wake up with this thought that I'm no good. Why even bother? We go to bed. We can't even sleep because we're replaying all the mistakes we've made. Have you ever been there? I have. Where I'll go to bed and the enemy will bring up a mistake I've made from years ago. And I'll just think about it and I'll realize this is the enemy's tactic. This is what the enemy does. He accuses the brethren. But I thank God that who I actually am is not based on my worst moment. I thank God that who I am is not based on the worst thing that I've done. Who I am is not my worst decision. It's not my worst condition. It's not my worst mistake. It's not my most humiliating moment. My condition is not based on those things. It's based on what Jesus says about me. That's who I am. Who you really are is not based on your worst. Bondage begins when you believe Satan and you stop believing God. The enemy is a professional accuser. That's what he does. He has no shame in making you do something and then just condemning you for it. Like, that's messed up. You made me do that. And now you're beating me up for it? That's crazy. Satan says, he'll say something like this. Look at how you're living. You must not really be who God says you are. I can't believe Satan has the audacity to do that. To kick you while you're down. To tell you that you're no good. And I know this is true because even without without the, the devil making himself very known or clear, those thoughts go through our minds on the daily. That's why we have to capture them and confess who we actually are in Christ. I am not that person anymore. I am who Jesus says I am. I didn't buy it. I didn't earn it. I didn't do anything good for it. Devil, you're right. I did get it all wrong. But Jesus got it all right just for me. And it's because of what he has done that I can stand here today in confidence and in boldness and with some praise on my mouth because he set me free. That's who I am. Another weapon the enemy tries to use, this is a dangerous thing for the church. And if we're not careful, the weapon the enemy uses is he, he tries to get us to talk like him. Look at John 8, 43. Jesus is saying, why can't you understand what I'm saying? He says, it's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things that he does. How crazy is that? He's saying, he's literally saying, you can't hear my voice because all you're doing is listening to the enemy's voice. You're listening to the accuser. You're listening to him accuse you. Not only that, this is the scary part. You're listening to the devil accuse your brothers and sisters around you. And the more we listen to that voice, the more we start to sound like that voice. You sound exactly like who you're listening to. My question to you is who are you listening to? Are you listening to the accuser's voice? Are, are you believing when the enemy says, look at that person, they're no good, they fell, I knew it. I knew they wouldn't be able to last that long. I knew they would slip up eventually. Is this the heart that you have? No, that can't be anymore because Jesus set you free of, of some really bad things. How many know what I'm talking about? If Jesus set you free and loved you and had mercy on you, then I can have mercy on my brother and sister. We got to be careful that we don't start to sound like the accuser around the, pe the, uh, the people around us. We do this when we judge others and we kick them while they're down. We do this when we base our judgment of someone on their worst moment. We call someone, that's the, that's the adultery, you gotta stay away from them. 
that's the drug addict. They're just always going to be on drugs the rest of their life. That person's just a liar. They're just a liar. When we don't listen to the voice of God, we start to see people through the lens of Satan's eyes. We start to view people in their, in their worst condition with disgust. But that's not the way God saw you. When God saw you, he had compassion. When God saw you, he wasn't filled with disgust. He was filled with passion to save you. See, we don't serve a God who, who abandons us. We serve a God that will leave the 99 to search for you. We serve a God that was willing to give up the dearest thing to him, his own son, so that he can have a relationship with you. That's the kind of God that we serve. He loves you. So when we're listening to the voice of God, this is how we speak about the people around us. We see the gold in people. We see life in somebody. We see hope. You know, I thank God that we go to a kind of church that doesn't kick people while they're down. As a matter of fact, God sends us to the darkest places of the inner cities. God sends us to the toughest neighborhoods, the worst streets, to the people everyone else thinks are the worst people. And God says, that's the treasure. That's the gold. That's where my heart is. My heart is for those that are broken, that have no hope, that have no way out. My heart is for those people. And I, I thank God we go to that kind of church here. And I thank God we serve a God who loves us even in our worst condition, that won't kick you while you're down, that won't abandon you at your worst moment, but he'll say, Send his son even while you were a sinner to save you and to set you free. That's the kind of God we serve. You know, there's moments in my life where I felt like the worst person. And I thank God that we have a pastor that would literally go down to your level. Say, it's okay. We're going to get through this. Let's just go. We're going we're gonna to fight this together. All the bondage, all the pain, let's deal with this. You got a purpose. You have a destiny. You have a call on your life. What the enemy meant for evil, God will turn around for good. Let's go. Let's go. Let's move. But that's the heart of God. And we have to know who we are in Christ. See, one sin doesn't define you. It's the cross that defines you. It's what Jesus did on the cross that identifies who we are. We are set free. We are children of God. We are the head and not the tail. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are redeemed. We are the righteousness of Christ. We have inherited his grace and his righteousness. That's who we are. Come on, am I preaching to anybody tonight? I know I'm not in a room full of perfect people, but I know I'm in a room full of some grateful people that are saying, God, I thank you that you save a wretch like me. You save someone that was messed up like me. You saw the gold in me, and I know that you know who I am, and I need to know who you are because my identity is found in you. Jesus doesn't base your identity on your worst moment. Look at John 8, 10. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? This woman was caught in the act of adultery. This woman was caught in a crime that warranted death. This woman was at her most humiliating, lowest moment of her life. Her life was over. There was no hope. The crime was committed. She was caught in the act, and the verdict was stone her to death. She was brought out to the streets, and everyone was ready, stones in hand, to kill her because she was caught in her worst moment. The enemy wanted to define her by her worst moment. Then stepped in Jesus, and he said, where are you? He talked to them. He said, 
He that is without sin, throw the first stone. Go ahead. Whoever hasn't sinned, you have permission, go ahead and stone her. Anybody? No one. They realized they were in the same boat as her. They were a sinner just like her. They had faults just like her. And in any moment, they could have been defined by their worst moment just like her. You want to know the only person in that circle that was without sin that could have cast a stone was Jesus. But instead, what does he do? He says, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And she says, no, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I. In that moment, Jesus redefined what the society and what the world thought was right. The world thought that, the, that we have to be defined by our worst moment. But Jesus broke that ideology and says, I do not define you based on your worst moment. I don't define you based on your lowest point. I do not define you. I say this, get up. I say this, sin no more. I say this, be free. I say this, be whole. I say this, be healed. I say this, stand up, rise and walk. I say this. Jesus doesn't define us by our worst moment. Number one, truth about who you are is it's not based on your worst. Number two, it's not based on your best. You know, one of the biggest competitors to the gospel, actually, let me rephrase that, because God has no rival. But one of the, one of the weapons that the enemy uses the most is religion. And what religion says is you must earn the affection and the love of God. Your acceptance is based on how good you can be. It's a never-ending cycle. Because no matter how good you get, you can always get better. And religion always tells you, you are not good enough. Here's a major truth about who you are. It's not based on your best moment. Now this is really big, especially for leaders here at the church, because we can get caught up in this idea that if I perform better and I do better and I sin less, then I'm more accepted by God. But that's a lie from the pit of hell, it's not true. You are not more loved because you're more good. You're not more accepted because you're a better child or a better kid. Just imagine if your child, a newborn baby, was born in the hospital and you're holding the baby and the first thought that comes to your mind is, I hope you're good enough to be my child. Now I'm not a father yet. I will be. This is not an announcement. But I know this, I'm not going to look at my child's eyes. I'm not going to look at the cute little button nose. And I'm not going to think to myself, I hope you can be good enough to be my child. First emotion, I can't wait. First emotion that will come out of me is just a spew of love. I feel just like I want to raise a child, protect the child. Be there for my child. And this is the way the father looks at you. You know, God doesn't say, I hope you're good enough for my affection. You know that God never says, I hope you're good enough to earn my love. You know, God never says, I hope you're good enough to be called my child. He never says it, and he has never spoken that. And there's never been a word that came out of his mouth. As soon as he saw you, he loved you. And as soon as he saw you, he wanted a relationship with you. And as soon as he saw you, he sent his son to die on the cross, and he made the way so you could come out of the, the pit of the valley to be joined with him. Jesus paid the debt that we owed, we didn't pay it. Ephesians 2.8, for it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is by God's what? Grace. It is by God's what? Grace. What is grace? It is unmerited favor. Basically, all it means is you didn't deserve it. 
but he gave it to you. That's good news. And he says it's only by that that you have been saved. It is not the result of your own efforts. It is not the result of your best moments. It's not the result of your highlight reel. Not the result of how many good things you have done. It's not the result of that. It's just based on his grace alone. It's a gift so that no one can boast about it. There was a moment, I want to just share this story. Jesus was baptized. And when he was baptized, he hadn't, really, he hadn't done ministry. He wasn't out doing all kinds of ministry and healing the sick and raising the dead. And first thing he did, one of the first things is get got baptized. Go to Matthew 3, verse 16. Then after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. Check this out, verse 17. Let this verse sink in your heart as I read it. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. This is my dearly loved child. This is my dearly loved daughter brings me great joy. He's speaking about you. You bring me joy. And I love you so dearly. Not because you earned it. Not because you were good enough for it. I just love you. And you bring me so much joy. You know what's crazy? Immediately after that, he goes to the wilderness to be tempted. And one of the first things Satan does to tempt Jesus, he doesn't tempt him. And we know that he tempts him with the bread and he tempts him with uh, uh, some other things. He's trying to jump off a cliff. But we think, we think that he's being tempted because he's hungry and his temptation is to eat because he's so hungry. But the real temptation was to doubt what God said about him. The real temptation was to doubt that God really does love him and he is a beloved son and God is pleased with him. Satan, in, in, if you go to down to chapter 4, verse 3, the devil came and said, if you really are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. If God really does call you his child, if you really are called by God, if you really are set free, if you really are a Christian, if you really are a disciple, if you really are if you really are call you a love son by God, then try to validate it by being a really good person. Try and validate your salvation by how good you can be. This is what Satan tried to tempt Jesus with. Satan tried to get Jesus' validation from his own works rather than just depending on what the Father said about him. See, the, great, the gateway sin is taking your eyes off of the gospel. It's taking your eyes off of the gospel for your worth and your salvation and your validation. Anytime we put our eyes on anything other than Jesus Christ for our well-being and our salvation, then we fall into a trap of the enemy. The trap is the devil wants to get you to think that religion can save you, but it never can. The trap is the devil wants you to think that being a good person can save you, but it can't. Jesus responds, and he says this confidently. He, say, he, he tells the devil, get out of here, Satan. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Which leads to the final point, point number three. Who you are is not based on your worst. Who you are is not based on your best. Who you are, it's only based in Jesus. Colossians 3.3 3 says, for you died to this life and your real life. Someone say, my real life. Look at someone next to you and say, your real life. Your real life is hidden with Christ in God. When you are in Jesus, you are dead to the old you. I know that's good news for somebody. Because you know what Jesus is insane? He's not just trying to make your life better. He means he's really going to kill the old person and give you something brand new. 
This is good news to somebody in here because I know there's somebody in here that doesn't need a makeover of your old lifestyle. You need a brand new life. You need a reset. You need a redo on your life. I made one too many mistakes to try and get a makeover on my lifestyle. God, I need something brand new. And God says, don't worry. I got something I've been waiting to give you. A brand new heart, a brand new mind, a brand new habit, a brand new lifestyle, a brand new way of talking, a brand new way of walking, a brand new way of living, a brand new way of thinking, a brand new way of fighting the fight. I can't, I'm going to give you all something brand new. I, I, don't, I don't just need this car detailed. This thing is totaled. I can't even drive this car anymore. I can't live this life anymore. God, I need something brand spanking new. And God says, I already got it for you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I already had it written up. I knew what I wanted you to be. I knew I called you to be an evangelist. I knew I called you to be a worshiper. I knew I called you to be someone, a light in your family, a leader in your home, a father to your kids. He had it written up already. He had something brand new waiting for you. And all it took was not trying to be good. All it took, it didn't take trying to make up for mistakes. All it took was turning in the keys to your old hoopty car of a life and saying, God, give me something new because I'm done with this old lifestyle. I need a brand new start. Your life is not based on your works. It's only based on Jesus. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. I love this scripture. It says your real life. Oh, I love that. I feel like a lot of us are living a fake life right now. I, you know what's crazy is even Christians are living a fake life and, and we're trying to put makeovers over, over the bondages and we're trying to earn our way to God's affection. And God is saying, I already did all that work for you, honey. I already did all, I paid all that price for you. You got to stop trying to pay for what's already been paid for. Just imagine you going to the, the debt collector and say, can I pay for my debt a second time? Yeah, right. That'll never happen. But when we try to earn our way to God's love, we're trying to pay for what the cross already did. It's all about Jesus. Jesus' record becomes your record. 1 Corinthians 1.30, God has united you with Christ Jesus. And for our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. Someone say, he made me right with God. He made us pure and holy and freed us from sin. So you know what God says about you? He says you're a new creation. He says you're his workmanship. God says that he, he has a plan for you of good and not of evil. God says that you're a masterpiece. Someone say, I'm a masterpiece. God says that you can do all things through Christ. Someone say, I can do all things through Christ. God says that you are valuable. Someone say, I'm valuable. God says that you have a purpose. Someone say, I have a purpose. God said that you're chosen. God said that you're a royal priesthood. God says that you're a holy nation. God says that you're no longer slaves to sin in Jesus' name. This is what he says about you. And it's time that we start to believe what Jesus said about me. I'm done believing the lie. I'm done believing the lies of the enemy. I'm done believing in my own works. I need to put my faith in the only name that can save, the only name that could change me, the only only name that can make me whole and that is the name of Jesus. the name of Jesus. the name of Jesus. come on let's all stand to our feet and give God some praise tonight come on if you're thankful for what Jesus has done in your life I want you to give him 10 seconds of praise because he's worth it See, the more we know him, the more we know who we're called to be. God, I want to know you. Jesus, I want to know what you have done. God, I want to pay attention to you. God, I want to fix my eyes on you, not on the waves, not on my own life. I want to put my eyes on you. Just close your eyes for a second. Maybe lift your hands to heaven. Tonight, we're introducing you to the one, the only one who can save you, validate you, 
affirm you, set you free, liberate you. He's the only one. It's Jesus. And right now, maybe you've had an issue with defining your life by your worst moments. If you've had an issue with this, it may, may come up like this. You don't forgive yourself. And you tell yourself that that's how things are going to be. Or maybe you struggle with trying to define yourself by your best moments. And the way that comes up is you just never feel good enough. You just don't feel like you can match up. You compare yourself to people around you. You always look at others and you think, why can't I just get it right like them? If you're dealing with any one of those two things, then what I want you to do is just come out of your seat. Make your way out of your seat right now, wherever you are. Make your way out of your seat right now. If you're saying, I've been defining my life based on my worst moments, or I've been defining my life and trying to earn God's affection and love, what I want you to do, quickly, quickly, come out of your seats and come up here to the front and receive prayer, receive breakthrough. Let's make this a moment of freedom and healing. Come on, church, let's clap it up for everyone that's coming up right now. They're coming up all the way from the back. Come on, come on, I know there's more. If that's you, you've been trying to define yourself by things that are not from God. If that's you, come out of your seat. Come out of your seat, make your way up here. Make your way up here, make your way up here. Come on, if there's more, I know there's more, there's more. Come on, there's more. If that's you, this is your moment, this is your time to make your life to make your life defined by the cross, no longer defined by your past mistakes, no longer defined by your inadequacy, but make your life defined by what Jesus says about you. I know there's some more out there. If that's you, I wanna invite you to come up here and let's make this a moment where we change forever and we give God our full heart, our full attention, our full life. And I know we're, we're talking about defining who you are. And for those out there who are saying, I want to give my heart to Jesus. You're saying, I don't know. If I were to die today, I don't know where I'd go. Because there's only one or two places. It's heaven or hell. Before anyone else leaves, please. Before anybody else leaves. If tonight you're saying, I don't know where I'd go. But I want to know that if I were to die tonight, that I would go with the Father for eternity. You want to put your faith in Jesus. The truth is there's a price for sin and that's death. But Jesus paid the price on the cross so you don't have to pay it. But the only way we receive that free gift is when we put our faith in Jesus and we repent of our sins. We repent meaning we turn away from our old life. We leave it where it's at and we just come to the feet of Jesus. And we put our faith in him for a new start. If tonight you want to put your faith in Jesus, if you want to know for sure that if you were to die tonight, you'd spend eternity with the Father in heaven, then when I count to three, I want you to boldly raise your hand. Don't hold it back. Don't be afraid. But without being ashamed, we're going to celebrate with you. We're going to clap for you. When I count to three, raise your hand. One, two, you're saying, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to know that I spend eternity with the Father. One, two, three, raise your hand, raise your hand. I see those hands, I see those hands, I see those hands. I see that hand back there. Anybody else? I see your hand, anybody else? If you raise your hand tonight, I want you to do something. If you can make your way out of your seat, we'd love to pray with you. Come on up tonight. If you raise your hand at church, let's clap for everyone that raised their hand. Come on up, come on up, come on up. I'm proud of you guys. I'm proud of you guys. This is the biggest decision we'll ever make. We may need a few more altar workers up here. 
want everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, forgive me for defining my life on my worst moment. And forgive me for trying to earn your love when you freely give it to me. I thank you that you sent your son to die on a cross and to raise from the dead so that I can be saved. I put my faith in you, Jesus. From this day forward, I'll never be the same. Fill me with your spirit. Renew my heart and give me new life. My life is yours. I know who I am because I know who you are. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, if you're up here at the altar, there's one more step we need. We have a class coming up. It's called Holy Warriors. Your next step is to get baptized and sign up for Holy Warriors. This Sunday, you can get baptized. You can ask, really, the person in front of you if they can help you get baptized. And sign up this Sunday at 9 a.m. You can join Holy Warriors. You can, you can jump right into the class Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Be here. The person in front of you is going to pray with you, and they'll give you more information on how to sign up. We need a few more ladies, uh, altar workers, and, and over here as well. Church, we love you so much. Men and women, we have a service this Friday night. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be powerful. We love you, church. Remember, if God's for you, there's no one who can come against you.